Today, we're welcoming a special guest, Chiho Kaneko. Chiho is a member of the Board of Directors for Fairwinds Energy Education. She's a visual artist and journalist. Chiho worked for some time for the Awate Nippo Daily Newspaper in Japan. Since the Japanese earthquake and nuclear accident, she's traveled to Japan four times. One of those was to the Fukushima Prefecture. She's joining us today to talk about her experiences and insight. Chiho, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for having me. And as always, we have Arnie Gunderson joining us. Arnie, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Hi, Chiho. Hi. So, Chiho, let's go right to you. If you could start by just talking a little bit about what it was like uh, in northern Japan before the March 2011 accident. I was born and raised in Iwate Prefecture, which is one of the six uh, northeastern prefectures of Japan. Uh, Iwate is um, north of Fukushima. In fact, uh, Fukushima is the, the southernmost uh, prefecture of those six. And um, it's those that region is generally considered to be uh, rural by an agricultural big mountains, beautiful rivers, and beautiful coastal um, lines and fishing uh, grounds. Uh, sort of like uh, New England of the United States because uh, it's you know, considerably colder compared to the rest of Japan. So, Chiho, it sounds like you know, New England with the, with the mountains and the coastal, uh, except that uh, in addition, there's earthquakes and tsunamis. Yes, that's the case, and that's to unfortunate too. So Chiho, setting aside the obvious effects of an earthquake, how did things change in northern Japan after the accident? Well, first of all, the earthquake and the tsunami uh, completely devastated the um, you know, eastern part of the, uh, those six uh, prefectures, um, Iwate, Miyagi, Fukushima, for the most part, and the earthquake uh, actually took place uh, off the coast of uh, Miyagi. So, you know, it was very close and thousands of people uh, died in an instant. And people's lives got uh, completely um, destroyed. A lot of people relocated, uh, trying to rebuild. But then on top of it, um, the fallout from the uh, reactor uh, came and now all those uh, uh, debris and rubble uh, on the coast. Some towns cleared it, but in some areas, like in Fukushima, they're still sitting there because they're highly radioactive. And the big issue today in Japan, this is you know uh, throughout Japan, is that how to deal with those debris and rubble, because nobody wants to accept in their incinerators by by burning. You end up sort of. Um, spreading the radioactivity throughout Japan. And yet, you know, it's almost impossible to process all that uh, debris within uh, those small regions. And people's lives are uh, sort of um, completely swept under uh, from their feet. You know, Joe, we had spoken about this issue of incineration uh, uh, almost a year ago on, on, the, on the Fairwind site. And, and, you know, there's two concerns. There's the concern of what goes back up into the air, and then separately what, what stays behind. The ash from the incineration is highly radioactive too. And so now the Japanese are, have a, a, a waste problem, but then when they get rid of the waste, they send some up into the air and then some down as ash. So it's a problem that doesn't go away. Yes, that's the case. Um, it is because of the amount of the um, debris um, this is a huge, huge problem. To give you uh, some sort of an idea um, where my home prefecture is, my parents' home is in Morioka, which is in, right in the middle of the yeah, Iwate prefecture, which is about 150 miles north of uh, Fukushima Daiichi reactors. So even in Morioka, f some foods such as, say, wild mushrooms or... Uh, wild greens um, are found to contain above the limit in some areas uh, of cesium, radioactive cesium. And so school lunches, even in my home uh, prefecture, 
a lot of school lunches are being tested every week um, to make sure that the um, radiation radiation level in the you know ingredients are low enough, safe enough for children. And I imagine this you know weighs heavily on the minds of the Japanese. Uh, quite a shift from being able to just go to the market and buy fish to going to the market and not knowing if the fish you're buying is radioactive or not. How are the Japanese coping with this sudden change? Well, some people um, worry more than others, just like anywhere else. I think a lot of farmers are concerned about uh, what's in their food. And um, in Morioka, um, there is the uh, organic food store, just a purveyor of uh, local organic produce and such. The owner, Mr. Ojima, actually set it up on his own a food radiation testing equipment. He did that in the summer of 2011. That was quite early. And so to ensure that the, uh, he could provide um, food uh, produce to his customers um, to, and by saying that, okay, I've tested this food so you can, you know, you can see what's in there. And people can also bring uh, the food uh, they, they want to have tested to his store for nominal fee and see exactly, you know, what, what's in that food. Well, that's fascinating. You know, it, it, you go to a supermarket and, uh, you know, you might have the light bulb aisle and you might have uh, you know, the meat aisle, but here's a guy with a, with a scintillation detector in his supermarket. That, uh, uh, that really changes uh, the atmosphere in the store. You know, it would be like uh, taking, a, taking an apple from uh, New England and, and uh, having it checked for PCBs because it was near the Hudson River or something like that. It's, it's a pretty amazing concept that a, a, a store has to do that. It's not that common, actually. I wouldn't say that the, um, the majority of people in, in my home, hometown are that concerned about it, to be fair, because... Most of, you know, major supermarkets, they don't exhibit that kind of uh, information. However, things are much uh, different in Fukushima Prefecture itself, uh, where I, I had visited um, just for the first time the other day. There, you know, you see everywhere in a store, I mean, in, even, you know, just a major uh, supermarket chains, you see, okay, this food is tested and it didn't have the uh, radiation above the limit. So the kind of food that the people are uh, people used to eat or people are used to eating uh, in those no northern regions is sometimes uh, no longer available. For instance, people might still use use them and pick pick and eat them. But wild mushrooms are one of the worst things in terms of uh, radi radiation contamination. For some reasons, uh, they seem to uh, pick up a lot of cesium. So those, a lot of times, you know, um, wild mushrooms contain um, higher levels of uh, cesium-134, 137. And that's the case in Iwate. And so you can imagine what it would be like in Fukushima. And also, if you talk about agricultural products, Let's say in Fukushima, persimmon, it's a fruit on a tree. And persimmon is one of their major agricultural products. And the, the town of Date, where I visited, is well known for their dried persimmons. However, not only the, um, the persimmon fruits uh, themselves contain uh, a lot of uh, radioactive materials, but also... The traditional way of preserving them, which is to dry them, you know, in the air naturally, actually concent concentrates the uh, um, cesium. So those products are completely now off the table. So what happens is that you not not only you can't eat the food that you're used to eating, but also you are in danger of losing the traditional ways. You know, Chio, there was also just recently a scientific study that showed the uh, cattle that had been left behind to, to just roam through Fukushima Prefecture were uh, loaded with uh, cesium, and that the concentration of cesium in the, in the baby cattle 
was uh, was 50 percent higher than in uh, the the mother cows. And that makes sense because babies are growing so much faster, and the cesium concentration, of course, goes to faster growing organs. But um, um, yeah, it's it's all over the the mushrooms, but it's also in the uh, in the meat of the cattle uh, that uh, that were left behind in the prefecture. It, it's got to be sad for the, the traditional farmers who've been at this for a long time. Yes, well, it's actually not just the cows that were left behind, but also this was um, you know the, during the year of 2011, but. Um, a lot of cows uh, and cattle was fed um, the uh, contaminated hay in the um, immediate aftermath of the accident. And, you know, farmers at the time, or even the government, wasn't aware of that sort of things. You know, nobody, well, I think, you know, in a way, you might say it's a common sense, but nobody really paid much attention to, to, to the uh, hay. And... What happened was the um, cows and cattle that ate uh, the contaminated hay, which were basically, you know, people leave hay outside uh, over winter, and they just keep feeding their uh, livestock. The cows that were fed hay that were left outside during the accidents, they all found to contain fairly high level of cesium. So there was a massive, massive beef recall that took place in 2011 in those northern regions. For, a, for some time, for a while, the beef was completely banned from that area, including Iwate. You know, it, it's, I think what I'm taking away from hearing you is the things we all take for granted. You know, uh, breathing fresh air, drinking fresh water and and, you know, going down to the creek and catching a fish, you can't take that for granted anymore. Uh, is, that, is, is that the case? That's the case. In a way, it's really sad because I walked all over Japan, northern Japan, and I went to Fukushima for the first time. And I, at some point, I had this realization that by just treading on the contaminated soil, I'm actually transporting radioactivity to other places and it's really sad to think that it's not about labeling Fukushima as the uh, you know place that you don't want to go it's not that it's just the reality that the the northern Japan not just in Fukushima but northern Japan is contaminated that's a reality and people are just are transporting that the contaminants out to the, whenever they travel elsewhere. They bring in bringing with them, and it just occurred to me that when the hoof and mouth disease happened outbreak uh, occurred in Japan some years ago, you know the government spent a lot of efforts in containing that disease, and in a sense, you know they basically cordoned off the entire area and checked every, you know, monitored every single vehicle and people who are going into the area. Well, you cannot see radiation easily. So what's happening is that there's a gradual and constant dispersing and spreading of radioactive materials inadvertently. Nobody wants to do it, but we're all doing it. That's a really creepy, macabre feeling that I I had when I was in Japan. You know, there was a a person in one of the prefectures to the north, who wanted to give a message to Tokyo Electric. Uh, can you tell us about him? Yes. One of the most disturbing things uh, in the aftermath of the triple disaster in Japan was that there a lot of uh, frustration and anger, naturally. And in, if it's for tsunami and earthquake, you can sort of direct your anger to nature, but also ultimately you say, well, you know, that's, just there's nothing we can do about it, and you move on. But for the um, in the case of a reactor accident, you don't know who to blame. Well, you do blame people who promoted uh, nuclear power, maybe, but also you know there are so many conflicting emotions and interests and people basically fighting among themselves. I mean, they're fighting with their neighbors. They're getting upset because your neighbor got compensation, but you didn't, that sort of things. Some mothers feel like they cannot financially relocate. 
So they stay and they accept the fact that they're going to live with the radiation. But then others feel like, well, they cannot, you know, sort of subject their children to potential health risk. Hearing all those uh, conflicting information and emotions, I was very disturbed. And then one day, I read this um, in uh, some kind of an email, the the group email that I subscribed to, that uh, there was this person, one person from Fukushima, carried a dirt, a bag of dirt from his home in Nihonmatsu, Fukushima, walked incrementally because he has some day job, and then maybe took a little over a month and walked to uh, TEPCO headquarters in Tokyo and delivered the bag of dirt. And his intention was that, well, you know, maybe it's illegal to uh, transport radioactive material, but in that sense, it's ridiculous to really con- control something like this because it's everywhere now. And he felt like, well, he didn't ask for this uh, bag of dirt. He wanted them to sort of feel what it's like to be surrounded by things that you didn't ask for. I was I was struck by such a simple, honest act of plea that this man did. So I ended up sort of uh, communicating with him, thanks to my friend, and uh I ended up seeing him for the first time the other day, uh, which was uh, quite uh, an inspiration. I visited him in Fukushima. Chiho, can you talk maybe a little bit about the polarization that's going on with the Japanese public, how some people have accepted this problem while others still feel that it may be not patriotic to talk about this problem? Yes. That is a very, very complicated issue. It's amazing that, you know, how attached people are to the place where they live. And even though most people are aware how badly contaminated their town is or their home is, it is very difficult to shed that attachment. And they hold out hope for returning if they are, you know, evacuating that sort of thing. But then what I find is that the um, mothers with small children especially, they seem to have very different uh, take on the reality compared to the rest because they are the direct link to life, you know, the future. And they feel like if they don't do something about uh, protecting their children, nobody will. So they are the ones who say, well, you know, the government is really not doing enough to, you know, help people move to a safer place. I would say farmers have mixed feelings about the situation. You know, on one hand, they might feel like they didn't ask for the uh, this contamination, so they're very upset, and, you know, they're trying to uh, get the government to compensate for the uh, loss. But also, they too want to sort of restore the land if there is a way to do so, so that they can continue to live there and continue to grow food. So everybody has slightly different priorities, I guess, and take on the situation. And that's exacerbated by the fact that there are conflicting analysis, inf- interpretation on the, the health effects of radiation. So there's lots of room for disagreement. Yes. Chiho, what do you see as the future of northern Japan? Where does everything go from here? I don't know, (laughs) to put it simply. Well, if you read the paper, a lot of um, headlines are very positive, you know, sort of a news of recovery of or news of, you know, reducing radiation levels and etc., but those news, uh, the headlines are often interspersed with, okay, uh, the other day another, you know, food item was found to contain above the limit, you know, cesium or whatever. So now it's off the table, that sort of things. And a lot of people are suing the government and TEPCO for various reasons. So I really don't know what's in store for the future I think we are at the, a lull between two storms. I think we had the, you know, the first storm of of the immediate after effects of the accident, and and frankly, it's too early to get the cancers yet. 
you know, the latency for thyroid cancer is a little more than five years. And the lung cancer is, you know, five to 10. So I think we've seen this horrific accident and there was, you know, anger and fear. And now we're in this period when, uh, you know, maybe it's the eye of the storm, but the, the next wave is coming. And, you know, what my concern has always been is that um, people were needlessly irradiated. And now, of course, unfortunately, the Japanese are going to be um, reporting uh, higher than normal cancer rates. That's going to be life in Japan for a long time to come. One thing that um, some people are very concerned about is, of course, you know, what's going to happen to their own health. Some people that I've met, they experience already some kind of a... a ill health just by simply living there. I think a lot of people have this anxiety about what's going to happen to them. So those people are also concerned that they're going to be sacrificed and forsaken ultimately because apparently in Chernobyl, a sort of government suppressed the um, study that connects people's uh, you know, sickness, illness to the uh, radiation. Official study indicates that the uh, um, health effects were not that bad. And so people in Fukushima feel like the same thing is going to be said about them in the future. But then reality actually might be different. So those are really palpable uh, anxieties and fears that uh, I, I sensed while I was in Japan. You know, let me just talk to that just for a split second. There's a, um, a, a, a symposium in New York City on uh, March 11th and March 12th. Um, we'll have more information up on the website. But while the official sources are, um, are quoting uh, one line of, of thought, in fact, there's a large group of scientists who've already I, documented um, problems developing in Fukushima. You know, these same scientists documented problems in, uh, in Chernobyl, and, and some of them were actually thrown in jail for five years in Belarus as a result. So when I hear about the official numbers coming out of Chernobyl, frankly, there was such a massive cover-up in the Ukraine that uh, I don't believe any of the official numbers. And I think this time is different. We have a chance using the Internet and, and citizen scientists throughout the world to really document what's going on in Fukushima like we never did at Chernobyl and like we never did at Three Mile Island. So, you know, that's really why we started the Fairwinds website and, and, and why Chiho's on the board of directors is to, uh, one, keep the public aware and to, two, get the public's information so that it can be disseminated through symposia like the one in, in, in New York City in, in, in March. Well, Chiho and Arnie, thanks so much for joining today. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And that about does it for this week's edition of the Energy Education Podcast. You can catch us back here next Sunday and every Sunday for more on what's happening in the world of nuclear news. Also, don't forget to like us on Facebook. <laughs>